Good evening and welcome to The Right Side, the show where we talk about today's news, views, trends and opinions from an admittedly conservative perspective. I'm your host, Chris Pareja, and this evening we're joined by the authors of Uncle Sam Can't Count, Bert Folsom and Anita Folsom. Welcome to the show. Hi. Thank you. So what would prompt you guys to um, write books, especially about things as uh, potentially uh, controversial as Uncle Sam not being able to count. Have you guys done this before? We have. We wrote, we co-authored FDR Goes to War, which is part of a two-part series. I did the first part called New Deal or Raw Deal. So we had two books on the Franklin Roosevelt administration explaining the problems and why we didn't get out of the Great Depression. Okay. And so you guys have made kind of a career out of poking the government in the eye. <laughs> yes. Uh, Bert began lecturing for various uh, organization, Young America's mm -hmm. Foundation, over 30 years ago. And he, in lecturing and, and re doing more reading, he began working up lectures on people like Cornelius Vanderbilt, James J. Hill, and uh, those lectures actually became one of his early books, Myth of the Robber Barons. But we have taken all of that knowledge over a period of about 30 years, and that is what is in Uncle Sam Can't Count. Okay. So tell us a little bit more about the premise of the book. Uh, sure. What's your goal? Well, we've had corporate subsidies, these government interventions, trying to pick winners or losers, uh, pick favorites to give federal aid. We've had that going on since the administration of George Washington. And many people don't know that, that mm -hmm. it's gone that's back right. that far. It's failed virtually every time, and that's the, the message. We need to learn from the past, and these stories that Anita and I tell about the failures of government aid to the steamships, government aid to the transcontinental railroads. George Washington thought a federally funded fur company for the fur trade would keep the British in Canada from encroaching on American soil. They were so incompetent, the British were encroaching exactly where the federal company was, and it took a private fur trader, John Jacob Astor, to run the business successfully. It gives you kind of a clue. My gosh, the federally funded company went broke. The private company produced the first American to be worth $10 million, John Jacob Astor. Mm -hmm. And so this is not a new trend. We like to think that our current administration and everyone feels that their current administration yeah. is the most inept, the most corrupt, or the, the most um, eager to, to be cronyistic or, or choose... Uh, winners and losers, as you said, sure. but really since the mm -hmm. beginning of time, which is what we thought that the Founding Fathers were trying to prevent from the beginning. Yes. yes. No, yes. you're right. The Constitution in Article 1, Section 8 is very restrictive on where the government can be involved, and part of that was because the Founders recognized that uh, you're looking at the future, whether you want to build a better gun, uh, an automobile, whatever might be the wave of the future, that it's better to let entrepreneurs tinker with it right. with limited government rather than having the government step in and try to pick who ought to get a subsidy to make the right. business work. Right. And even in that story from George Washington and fur trades and everything else, you're looking at a scenario where still people who aren't actually in the business are chosen by the government to run the business until it fails. And at that point, you need to bring in supervision from the private sector, which government seems to despise. Yes. That, that's exactly what happened, yes. And even with the administration of George Washington, he couldn't make it work. And we had an early disaster there. And, uh, and it just shows every generation has to be educated that the government pick, trying to pick winners and losers just doesn't work. And so, I mean, the, the obvious question to ask is, why does the government continue to choose these losers, <laughs> right? Part of it is we just, we don't, the stories never get properly told. In other words, it, after it happens, they say, boy, that was a disaster. You take the airplane subsidies. We had a federally funded subsidy to Samuel Langley to invent the airplane. He seemed like the logical person to do it. He was head of the Smithsonian Institution, a great scientist and inventor. He, uh, he had written a book on aerodynamics. And so that funding failed and his airplanes crashed and then a, a week, uh, roughly a week after his second one crashed, the Wright brothers with $2,000 of their own money invent the airplane. Mm -hmm. And you think, well, now we learned something, but then 
What happens is the story gets told that the Wright brothers did a good job inventing the airplane, but Langley somehow gets left off, the subsidy. Right. And so we didn't realize the next generation doesn't fully grasp that it was the federal government's attempt to invent the airplane that was a disaster. And when private support came for an airplane, it was successful. And so we then repeat the story in the next generation. Textbooks do not tell these stories. And that's one of the reasons we wanted to write the book, mm -hmm. so that we can get this information out that these federal subsidies don't work. We can save our government a whole lot of money right. by abandoning them completely. Right, or if they're going to buy something, buy it from the pri private sector instead of developing it. We've yes. grown up, or at least I've grown up, in a, in a time where you believe that, or you're told that, government, there are, just, there are things that only government can do. But then the private sector keeps coming in and proving them wrong. For example, mm -hmm. one of the myths as I was growing up, when you've got the space shuttle and everything sure. else, is that only government can get us into space or develop a, an ample space program and, and everything else. But it wasn't until I was an adult that I went to the Smithsonian and saw what we actually launched into space, which really concerned me. It's like, yeah. that's aluminum foil and <laughs> sticks. That's, that, that People flew in that? Mm -hmm. Really? Um, whereas maybe if the private sector invented it, there could have been something completely more mm -hmm. substantial about the rockets and things that we, we tended to send out. Sure. So, it, exactly. So talk to us about some of the other stories that you've accumulated yeah. in the books and how cronyism or at least government subsidies um, lost out to... Well, of course, one of the biggest trends right now is green energy, and we have an entire chapter on that. And what you hear the government constantly saying is that their subsidies to green energy companies are working. Right. And the truth is, is none of them are working. The, all the money to Solyndra. Solyndra was supposed to be a wonderful thing. President Obama went to the plant, made a big speech, and uh, within a year, year and a half, the door shut. It was totally bankrupt. Right. And even then, President Obama refused to admit it was a poor investment. Same thing with a company called Inner One. And uh, with that, our esteemed vice president went, made a big speech there. Inner One was bankrupt within a year or so. Mm -hmm. Total disaster. The ethanol subsidies, ethanol, we're not anti-ethanol if it's done by the pri private sector. And we need American entrepreneurs who can come up with a way, a system, a product to produce ethanol and make it economically feasible. The government simply pouring money into ethanol subsidies has been a disaster. It's run up the price of corn for a while there. That's why chicken and, and other products that are corn-based often were so expensive. And ethanol has just not worked. The ethanol subsidies have been a big, big mistake. Right. And they've come from both Democrat and Republican administrations. Well, when it comes to getting subsidies, the people who've learned how to play the game often by mm -hmm. both sides anyway sure. to hedge their bets. Absolutely. Dwayne Andreas, who is the head of Archer Daniels Midland, uh, would, would fund both sides, uh, figuring he could get the ethanol subsidies out of the winter. Right. Mm -hmm. right. He began playing golf with uh, Hubert Humphrey, and then once Hubert Humphrey was not in the White House, he started, he gave money to Richard Nixon. At one time, uh, a, a thousand thousand dollar bills. One dollar bills, uh, or a thousand one hundred dollar bills. bills, right? And uh, anyway, secretly to his campaign, just a, a funnel of money, if they would continue supporting all of his energy companies, which included, you know, ethanol and a number of others. Mm -hmm. And so, is cronyism typically the thing that drives it, or individual politicians getting the in, or have you noted with all of these stories uh, a different yeah. kind of trend or a different entry? Well, uh, the politics are part of the reason that the subsidies don't work, because when you you sit there, why don't you were asking uh, Chris why don't they work? Because politicians, one reason is politicians can't pick. The winner because we don't know who the winner is going to be. Henry Ford was a, a virtual orphan. I mean, who how, who would pick him to invent the car? Edison was saying it ought to be an electric car. I mean, Edison would seem to be the one you'd go with. You can't really tell in an entrepreneurial environment who is going to have the right idea. You let the market test them out. When the politicians get involved, it's often, well, I have a guy in my home state. Uh, he has this really good idea. Let's back him for a subsidy. Right. And so the incentives for the politicians are to get mm -hmm. votes, and that can be done in ways that give subsidies to people who can help you out, rather than granting a subsidy to someone who might really have a good idea. Mm -hmm. well, let me ask you this. I mean, viewers that are out there right now might be wondering, well, 
would you say that there's ever a good time for a subsidy then, or are you just anti-subsidy? Well, in the book, we are we have been asked that question before. That's a great question, Chris, and we answer that by saying if it is a huge national emergency, and one of the few that we can find is World War II and trying to figure out how do we end this war as quickly as possible. And we feel that one of the very, very few examples is the Manhattan Project. And ironically, that was so secretive that we think that the, the secrecy surrounding the Manhattan Project to build the atomic bomb during World War II, we spent $2 billion during the war on that project. But the secrecy of the project meant that most political entrepreneurs didn't know about it, so they couldn't find it. Although I'm not saying it, it did, they didn't waste money at times, but the uh, overall leadership, General Leslie Groves, seems to have been a very honest man. And uh, that, that project produced an atomic weapon that we feel did end the war and very quickly and probably saved over a million American lives. But, I mean, what are, what are some other options, though? I mean, could there be entrepreneurial contact, contests, as an example, to develop these sure. the, the things where you're spreading the money against a, or amongst a competitive group as opposed to just picking one and at least having milestones or something like the investment community might normally do of mm -hmm. seed fund a few projects, see if they work, and then if it does, if their milestones met, do something else, or or what is the solution other than in a time of extreme emergency, or just? Well, the the best solution is to keep the government out of it and let the private sector do it. Even with the airplane, uh, as uh, as Bert was saying, once the Wright brothers showed that they could fly, and it took them, it took them a few years to really prove it. It, uh, it took five years, and then they went to France, flew their plane in France, and people were astounded. But what really helped with airplane development were these private prizes. There were prizes, for instance, for the quickest flight from London to Paris, or the, the longest flight. Once Wilbur Wright uh, won that by flying for over two hours. That was considered phenomenal, and he won a, a large cash prize. Or so, Charles Lindbergh. And Charles Lindbergh flying from New York to Paris. What was for a cash prize. For another cash prize. So that Money and sense people to perform. <laughs> now, you talk about free market and <laughs> jeepers. But, but those kinds of uh, incentives just seem to work better. Mm -hmm. Sure. And uh, that goes against the grain. Some people think, well, the experts ought to be able to figure this out. But the irony is that often the experts, you get committed to a point of view, your career is staked on that point right. of view and you miss it, and you miss it. And even great entrepreneurs miss it. Andrew Carnegie, the greatest steel entrepreneur in American history, was committed to rails. He thought it was always gonna be rails. Well, then when we switched uh, in the 1900s to skyscrapers as being the major source of steel, the company, U.S. Steel, ultimately could not make the transition because you're so committed to one way of doing something. So often the experts, even those who've succeeded in the past, can't make the next leap for the next generation to get the job done. And politicians do not like to admit mistakes. They know that's going to, <laughs> that may be a shock, but they know that's going to be played back the next time they run for office. Yes. And getting a politician to admit money spent was wasted is, how often have you heard anyone say that when they were the ones who voted for it? Very seldom. Right, right, right. And we see this with a lot of the sub steamship subsidies. They, the, the Congress just could not admit that they were backing the wrong people, so they kept right. increasing the steamship yes. subsidy. Yes. Mm -hmm. Throw more money at it. That's Throw right. more money at it. And what you're advocating is instead of going for experts and government, sure. Root for the impassioned lunatic because they'll figure it out. <laughs> That's what it. Steve Jobs that, said. We, we, we opened the book actually sitting here in. Uh, in Northern California with a, a quote from Steve Jobs that those who, entrepreneurs are people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world and they often do. Right. But other people think they're crazy and some of our entrepreneurs, we talk a lot about Herbert Henry Dow in Midland, Michigan, which was a very uh, off the beaten path place when he began uh, Dow Chemical mm -hmm. and they called him Crazy Dow. He, he blew up a lab, he burned down his lab one time. He was trying to, um, to come up with chemicals out of uh, bromine and there were lots of uh, 
waste products being thrown down the drain. He was determined to use those waste products, and he he made something, and it blew everything up. His investors were furious. You know, the, the all the equipment was burned up. So they called him Crazy Dow. Um, James J. Hill, they called mm -hmm. the, he was going to compete with the transcontinental railroads that were government funded. He did and beat them, but his initial line was called Hill's Folly. Mm -hmm. uh, James J. Hill building the Great Northern Railroad. These people are looked at as being oddballs mm -hmm. and certainly not worthy of any kind of federal funding. And it's good that they didn't have it. Mm -hmm. Maybe that would have made them worse instead of better. And people thought the Wright brothers were very strange and they they went to Kitty Hawk North Carolina because it was remote they didn't want anyone stealing their ideas they had this uh, flying contraption they were ministers sons they wore uh, stiff white collars and ties even when they flew the planes and, and, and pushed the gliders and the plane their, their flying machine up the hill in a with a tie on and and the locals just thought they were crazy but they liked them because they were you know polite they didn't smoke they didn't cuss they didn't drink and they were very kind to the children so they just humored them and then one day this contraption took off and flew and the locals were just bug-eyed they actually made it I never, uh, until you were going through your details, I wouldn't have associated the, the Wright brothers with the Tea Party before, but you're talking about <laughs> religious fanatics who are conspiracy theorists who believe they can change the world and fly. Yeah, it sounds like they, they were Tea Party in between or something. They, they fit right in. Oh, yeah. they would. They would. Polite to the children and everything else. It seems to fit. <laughs> so, so tell me about some of the other stories that you guys have collected, because it, it, sure. I mean, these are things where... I think you're dispelling a lot of the myths about uh -huh. the grandeur of government, what well, you definitely are. So, Right. We, we need to keep in mind here, Chris, that uh, some of this sounds depressing. Oh, my gosh, failed government subsidies. And that's in there. We need to learn from it. But there's a heroic element in there because there are entrepreneurs who were competing against the subsidized companies and, and defeating them. Right. Even though the mm -hmm. other company had a subsidy from the government, Cornelius Vanderbilt became the first American to be worth a hundred million dollars. He starts out from this poor family in New York, and he's sailing. He's sailing steamboats for another fellow. Well, he eventually earns enough to buy his own, and pretty soon he's competing against this government-funded company right. that's going across the Atlantic, and another one that's going out uh, through, through eventually through Panama to get to. California, this is before the canal, but they're using a railroad in Panama to get people out to California for the gold rush. So in the 1840s and 50s, he's competing against them successfully. He cuts prices. The, the, even with a government subsidy, the government company was charging $500, $600 a passenger. Vanderbilt was doing it for $30 and $40 a passenger with no mm -hmm. subsidy. He was serving them food. He was being very efficient. And uh, he ended up making a profit Whereas the government company, charging more with a subsidy, went bankrupt. Well, you're almost describing our local bus systems here <laughs> as far mm -hmm. as it, it, the, to go on a bus, about 35% of the, of the overall operating charge is covered by fares. The rest is subsidized. And they're saying they're losing money at $3, $6 a ticket or something like that, where a private bus company, Megabus, uh, is running people from San Francisco to LA for the same fare yeah. uh, with Wi-Fi. That's a good example. Uh, and, I didn't know that. And so you're looking at, again, it's the, the private industry competing with the government and beating the bejeebers out of them and, and being successful. But what's interesting about some of the stories that you've told is the entrepreneurs have failed too. But they've come yes. back at it they, because their passion drove them to go right. mm -hmm. beyond possibly their private funding or beyond the money and they were forced to be more. Mm -hmm. Yes specific and more targeted in their That's approach, and ultimately they won. The government just failed on a grander scale, a more expensive scale, but to no success. Most entrepreneurs have failed several times, and, and that makes them uh, learn more, and then they're more careful with their funds when they do it again or they try again, so that it's very common. If, if you're the mother of an entrepreneur, get ready, because your child is going to probably fail some, succeed some too, but the failures are going to be there. So, yeah, if only, because the government has done so many things it's failed at, if only it were the same, where we would have an awesome government because of all of the failure and them getting smarter. Well, the funny thing is the entrepreneurs seem to have more fun than the people with the government subsidies. The ones with the government subsidies are perpetually concerned they'll lose their subsidy. Right. 
And the entrepreneur wants to succeed by producing a good product at a competitive price. And Orville Wright said, uh, Wilbur and I woke up today, we are doing what we want to do, trying to do it the best way we can, and nothing could be happier for us than to do that. Right. Okay, so other stories. Uh, what, uh, was there one that was particularly unknown to, to you and to many of the, the people that you've come across that would just, uh, just um, puts a, a point on it? You. Well, I think one chapter in the book that would uh, be new to many people, we're, we've lived a lot of our married life in Michigan, okay. and Michigan had an early governor who was only 19 years old. Governor of the state at 19. At 19, uh, Governor Mason. And at that time, as Michigan came into the Union in 1837. Seven. Right. He was technically acting governor, but anyway. Uh, he was acting governor, and then he was governor of the state. The big rage at that time was the Erie Canal. The Erie Ca Canal was, was built and opened. What year was the Erie Canal? He's the one with the date. <laughs> 1819. Eight, and the Erie Canal was a, a huge success. Well, everyone jumped on the, the federal or state-sponsored canal uh, bandwagon, if you will, and Mason did too, and, and decided that what Michigan needed was a big canal. And that was an utter disaster and other states tried canals, and so what you have to be careful of is even when you see something that looks like a success, the Erie Canal could have been built easily with private money and probably would have been better if it had been. Now that's something that a lot of historians will get very angry when they hear me say that. They don't agree, but that's our point. But the Erie Canal connected New York City up through the rivers and lakes in, in New York State to the Great Lakes. Well, that's a wonderful market. Of course, the Erie Canal could have been built with private money. Anyway, but when states saw the success of the Erie Canal for a while, Which and then it had problems. Which was state of New York, but it wasn't built with federal funds. But with state. But with state funds. Correct. Everybody jumped on the bandwagon, and Indiana, Ohio, Michigan, all started pouring money into state-owned canals. Then they also poured money into state-owned transportation of all sorts of types, and it all went bankrupt. It was a disaster. And many people don't realize that. So you, the, for the American public, you really have to watch these fads that come, and they are so popular. And right now, we are riding the crest of the fad of green energy, mm -hmm. and it is a huge boondoggle. And people, I'm sitting here in Northern California, and I'll say that again, green energy is a joke. Windmills don't make money. They are wasting farmland. Ethanol has been a terrible subsidy. Uh, Solyndra. Solyndra uh, went broke, as we said. Solar, but right. it, it is such a fad, and there's so much misinformation out there. Please get the facts. Right. That's what I would say. Well, do you think there is potential for these energy streams if it's not subsidized and if somebody just has a passion for yes. it and can develop them, do you think that they would ever get to a place where they would be effective and cost effective? Absolutely, but, but we need huge breakthroughs. We need a Steve Jobs, if you will, in the area of, of uh, electric batteries and power storage. That's one of the big problems and one of the big bottlenecks. We need better batteries. These windmills are extremely inefficient in how much energy they use to store energy, it's ridiculous. Yeah, it costs more. We it, they have them here in the East right. Bay area and the Livermore area, and it, there are lots of them that aren't running even when the wind is going at high rates of speed. And exactly. it's almost because it costs more to run them than it does to to just leave them and, turned and on. And that's insanity. And they kill they kill something like fifty thousand birds every year. Yeah, where they are, eat raptors for breakfast. Where, where are where are the bird uh, enthusiasts these days? Right. So. Eating drumsticks below the windows. <laughs> oh, that's not what oh, you meant. No, no. <laughs> well, we have just a few seconds left. Sure. Tell us where we can find more details about Uncle Sam Can't Count. Right, Uncle Sam Can't Count. It's on Amazon, and they could uh, anyone can go to bertfolsom.com. We have a website, BertFolsom.com, a blog, and uh, we have uh, lots of our books listed there. Click on it, and uh, that will give you all the information. And just spell Bert Folsom in ca mm -hmm. case people don't. B-U-R-T-F-O-L-S-O-M. Mm -hmm. Dot com? Dot com. Dot com. E even if they misspell it, we have most of the misspelled versions, <laughs> too. Yeah. Well, yes. Anita and Bert, thank you for joining us this evening. If you'll hold on for just a moment, we'll be back after a word from our underwriter, the Conservative Forum.
The conservative forum of Silicon Valley began with 20 conservatives meeting at a restaurant in November of 2003. Our mission is to promote the principles of American liberty through education. By 2012, we had grown to over 600 paid members. Our monthly meetings feature well-known and prestigious conservative speakers addressing issues that are critical to our country's very survival. This includes speakers like Victor Davis Hanson, Andrew Breitbart, David Horowitz, and many others. In addition to our monthly meetings, we sponsor a conservative local cable access TV show, The Right Side, covering today's topics. Our Constitution Discussion Group not only teaches the Constitution, but started our annual essay contest that awards two $1,000 scholarships to local high school seniors. We are a virtual clearinghouse for grassroots organizations by providing them with table space at no charge in our exhibit area. There are typically a dozen groups represented. If you are like-minded, join us at our next meeting and become motivated and empowered. Liberty made in America. And welcome back to The Right Side. That was a word from our underwriter, the Conservative Forum. And while we appreciate them immensely for making this show possible, what they're best known for is their speaker series. And that was the reason, actually, that we were blessed to have Bert and Anita with us here in the studio this evening, because they will be speaking at the Forum this evening, and I believe that starts around 7.30. Uh, doors open earlier at 7, and you will be able to see them as well as others in the near future, such as on May 6th, the Joe Arpaio will be here, Sheriff of Maricopa County, who's known for treating inmates like prisoners and enforcing border security, etc. June 3rd, Nani Darwish. August 5th, Gun Owners of America. In September, on the 2nd, is Mark Mix. And October 7th is Pam Geller. You can find out more at theconservativeforum.com. But to give you a little bit of insight, normally, first Tuesday of each month, you'll find us at 432 Steerland Road, about three minutes from here in Mountain View. I've always been a big fan of believing that entrepreneurs, when given the option, will always outpace government and uh, add competition not only to the marketplace but to our ability generally to make strides forward uh, for our economy, for our country, for our competitiveness, but also for our standard of living. And Uncle Sam Can't Count is a prime example or actually a, co a combination of many examples of just that fact. I encourage you to take a look, learn more about Bert and Anita and the book at BertFulsom.com and do your research and see if maybe you can be inspired to make changes uh, for the positive as well and take out government subsidies altogether and let the people who know what they're doing do what they do. On that note, I'd like to thank you once again for joining us on The Right Side. I've been your host, Chris Pereja, and I'll look forward to seeing you again in person or on the show sometime soon. Thanks again.